Blazing Saddles takes place in a small town called Rock Ridge in the year 1874, full of white people. A gang of higher ups, one of which played by Harvey Corman, but it's before the Star Wars holiday special, so it's okay to enjoy his work. Wants to force everybody to abandon the land so they can make some money, but the governor, played by writer and director Mel Brooks himself, appoints a new sheriff to protect them, played by Cleavon Little. Of course, they're just a little unkind to the man. Good morning, ma'am. And isn't it a lovely morning? Up yours, nigger. But he does strike up a friendship with a fast gunslinger called the Wacko Kid, played by Gene Wilder. The gang sends this monster Mongo to take them out, but the sheriff stops them and gains their trust. Then a whole bunch of weird stuff happens to end the film, but we'll save that for later because trust me, it's just bizarre. Am I wrong? Originally, the film was an idea by Andrew Bergman entitled Tex X after Malcolm X. Alan Arkin was to direct, and James O. Jones was even going to play the sheriff. No one would ever have the balls to call him the N-word. Are you crazy? Mel Brooks found the story fascinating and bought the rights from Bergman, hiring more writers to expand the outline. He even asked them to not write a polite script, but the writing process was chaotic to say the least. Blazing Saddles was more or less written in the middle of a drunken fist fight. There were five of us yelling loudly for our ideas to be put into the movie. Not only was I the loudest, but luckily I also had the writer's director to decide what was in or out. Allegedly, Brooks actually told his writers, write anything you want because we'll never be heard from again. We will all be arrested for this movie. Have you ever seen such a Cruelty. In the beginning, we had five people. One guy left after a couple of weeks. Then it was basically me, Mel, Richard Pryor, and Norman Steinberg. Richard left after the first draft, and then Normal Mel and I wrote the next three or four. It was a riot. It was a rioter's room. The title changed from Tex X to Black Farts to Purple Sage, and then one day Brooks came up with Blazing Saddles whilst he was taking a shower. He then had a vision for the opening song and advertised for a Frankie Lane type singer, but much to his astonishment, Lane himself actually offered to do it. Oh, what a nice guy. Frankie sang his heart out and we didn't have the heart to tell him it was a spoof. He never heard the whip racks, we put those in later. We got so lucky with his serious interpretation of the song. Originally, Richard Pryor was to play the sheriff, but due to his history of drug abuse, the studio refused to approve financing of him. John Wayne was offered the part of the wacko kid. Oh, great. Luckily, he turned it down, calling it too dark for his image. Dang, that was lucky. Gig Young was then cast, but collapsed on set during his first scene from alcohol withdrawal syndrome. And Johnny Carson was asked, but turned it down, which is when Wilder took over. Madeline Kahn auditioned, but was offended when Brooks asked to see her legs, thinking he was sexually harassing her. The director explained that he was a happily married man and he just needed to see if she could straddle a chair with her legs like Marlene Dietrich. She then obliged, but insisted on no touching. Smooth mouth, smooth. She totally bought it. All right, she caught me. However, the studio executives constantly conflicted with Mel Brooks because of the amount of times the word was spoken, in addition to several other dark scenes we'll talk about later. Luckily for him, his contract allowed him final content control and he refused to make any changes except one. There's a scene where the sheriff is seduced and the woman turns the lights off and confirms the black penis stereotype to be true, and originally the sheriff was then going to say from the dark, I hate to disappoint you ma'am, but you're sucking my arm. Why cut that out? That's hilarious. I think it's a big mistake. When pressed about his use of racial slurs so frequently, Brooks stuck to his guns and said both Cleavon Little and Richard Pryor gave him their blessing. If they did a remake of Blazing Saddles today, they would leave out the N-word and then you've got no movie. We received many letters of complaints after the film's release, but of course, most of them were actually from white people. They've smashed racism in the face, but they're doing it while you laugh. Even when you're laughing, you're not proud of what you're laughing at. However, the movie was nearly not even released in the first place. It was screened for a few executives and they only laughed a couple of times. The head of distribution actually claimed, let's dump it and take a loss, but others decided to give it a go and it would end up becoming their top moneymaker that summer, premiering on February the 7th, 1974. Controversy continued, however, as Hedy Lamar, whose name is kind of portrayed in the movie, they do change it slightly, sued them for infringing on her right to privacy. The studio paid her a small fee and gave an apology, while Brooks claimed she never got the joke. Well, what was the joke? We are not sure. It ended up grossing a worldwide total of $119.5 million at the box office, making it at the time only the 10th film in history to surpass the $100 million mark. In fact, the summer of 1975, Warner Brothers had no big pictures to release, so they released this one again. That's actually pretty amazing. Of course. The opening song is actually amazing. I can see why it was nominated for the Oscar, and I think it's funny with how seriously it's sung. He conquered fear and he conquered hate. He turned dark night into day. He made his blazing saddle. Oh look, they inspired Saving Private Ryan. That's kind of cool. This is hilarious to take place in church. Our town is turning into shit. 
Gene Wilder is easily the best part of the film. I personally find him the only interesting character and the friendship he has with the sheriff is well done and feels so natural. The two actors do have some amazing chemistry together. Since you are my guest and I am your host, what are your pleasures? What do you like to do? Blackface in Silver Streak, but weirdly that won't get me in nearly as much trouble as this film. You've got to remember that these are just simple farmers. These are people of the land. The common clay of the New West. You know. Morons. <laughs> <laughs> and what makes that line better is that Cleavon Little genuinely had no idea that Wilder was going to say that. So his reaction is real. He's known as having the fastest hands in the world and is delivered hilariously. He somehow takes a king off the chessboard without moving. He shoots a bunch of guns away without budging an inch. Wait, what's going on here? Hey, you can't park that animal over there. It's illegal. <laughs> okay, that is actually one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I mean, you expect him to punch out the dude and then BAM horse go bye bye. It's so unexpected, it's brilliant. I'm a terrible person. Qualifications. Rape, murder, awesome and rape. You said rape twice. I like rape. Oh sure, I make these jokes and everyone has a go at me and types angry comments. Mel Brooks does it and he's a genius. And they even shoot a guy just for chewing gum and then steal KKK uniforms. This is hilarious stuff. They need to slow down the gang from reaching them at one point. So they even put up a toll booth, which the criminals actually abide by and even go through one by one. That is so ridiculous. It is brilliant. The comedy is very hit and miss. Two of the black guys go off and end up in quicksand, which isn't very funny. Somebody on the bar tail neck. Somebody better on the bay. But what? Am I wrong? Or is the world rising? I don't know. But whatever it is, I hate it. But then it's saved because basically the white guys come back and it looks like they're going to rescue them. But then they just pull, pull the, the cart out of the sand instead and just leave them there. There we go. They saved it because that was actually pretty funny. Send a wire to the main office. And tell him that I said, ow! In wire, main office, tell him I said, ow. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, and that. But what's with this dude rubbing the statue across his crotch? We'll kill the firstborn male child in every household. I got it, I got it! So, what? we'll work up a number six on him. We should take Bikini Bottom and push it somewhere else! A whopping and a whopping. Every living thing that moves within an inch of its life. Except the women folks, of course. You spare the women? No, we raped the shit out of them at the number six dance later on. You know, I don't get offended by jokes. I, you know, as long as... I, I think anything can be made fun of. I really believe that. As long as it's a joke, no problems here. But this isn't really a joke. It, it just looks like it's just put in to sound edgy. There's no actual joke. It's just, oh, look how dark and daring we are. Now here, this gag actually does start off quite funny. Hell, I was born here, and I was raised here, and that gummin' I'm gonna die here. And no sidewinding, bushwhacking, horn swoggling, crocker crocker is gonna roll away biscuit cutter. Now who can argue with that? <laughs> okay, that works. I think we're all indebted to Gabby Johnson for clearly stating what needed to be said. Yeah, 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 we're good here, dude. Thanks. I'm particularly glad that these lovely children are here today to hear that speech. And you've ruined the joke by dragging it out for all eternity. Good job, guys. Good job. He is so painfully unfunny on camera here. Sign this, yes, sir, right here. Oh, okay, sir. give us a hand here. All right, sir. Work, 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 work. Hello, boys. Have a good night's rest. I missed you. Just one more bill for you to sign, sir. What the hell is this? This is the bill that will convert the state hospital for the insane into the William J. Lepetamine Memorial Gambling Casino for the insane. Gentlemen, this, this bill will be a giant step forward in the treatment of the insane gambler. Yes, bravo. It's actually times like this. I wonder how he got famous in the first place. And it never ends. It just keeps going forever. All right. Okay, is that it? Anything else? Just this urgent telegram from Rockbridge that arrived last Friday. Last Friday? Read it, read it. You wild 
Bitch. Sheriff murdered, church meeting bombed, reign of terror must cease. Send your sheriff immediately. Holy underwear! Please stop. Play with these boys in lieu of our other things. This friggin' thing is what? Either get funny or get bent. Oh, thank God, fade out. So, oh, Governor! Yes? No, I knew I was enjoying myself too much. I've got to talk to you. Come here. Have you gone berserk? Can't you see that that man is a nip? <laughs> Wrong person. Forgive me. Okay, that was funny. Hey! The sheriff is a nip! What do you say? The sheriff is near! Yeah, and so is that. This gag, the woman whispers, they tell her to speak up, and then when she does and starts shouting, everyone jumps. Gags like this, it feels like a ten-year-old wrote them. You can tell they had five writers because it's all over the place. And the sheriff is so annoying. Why did he have to be the main focus? Man, why you do that to yourself? <laughs> oh, you don't really want to know that. I do, I do. Well, if you must pry. I must, I must. Shut up, shut up! <laughs> oh hey, fart gags! Because that's the best way to improve your movie! And guess what? This film holds the record for being the first ever movie to feature a fart gag. But hey, have some more unfunny shtick of the sheriff in a costume tricking Mongo. Candy gram for Mongo! Candy gram for Mongo! Hey, Mongo. Sign, please. Thank you. Can you imagine James L. Jones doing that? Because that image alone is funnier than this. But hey, have a random song for no goddamn reason! She even falls asleep during this musical number. It is entirely pointless. I didn't even give her a funny reaction to finding out he's black. Why not? Everyone else did. I want you to round up every vicious criminal and gunslinger in the West. Take this down. I want rustlers, cutthroats, murderers, bounty hunters, desperados, mugs, pugs, thugs, nitwits, halfwits, dimwits, Vipers, snipers, con men, Indian agents, Mexican bandits, muggers, buggerers, bushwhackers, horn swagglers, horse thieves, bull dykes, train robbers, bank robbers, ass kickers, shit kickers, and Methodists! Is that something you prepared or did you just rhyme that many times in a row by accident? Now before the sun comes up, we're gonna build on this site an exact replica of the town of Rock Ridge. Oh. So the Patrick plan was, was actually real. It, wow. And yeah, this is actually done all in one night. It's a comedy, so I guess I can let it slide. I don't care how good a gunman you are, no pistol would be able to reach this far. And here, have a guy dancing for no reason to introduce one of the worst endings in film history. Throw out your hands, take out your tush, hands on your hips. working for Mel Brooks. Not in the face. They clearly ran out of ideas here entirely. And no, do not compare this to Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It was short, sweet, had a purpose, had a reason, and was hilarious. This, they had this big setup and then decided, fuck it, and started doing this for no reason. We get a Hitler cameo. The fight continues throughout the studio and it never ends. <laughs> Drive me off this picture. Drive the credits into this picture, please! And then he goes to the cinema to see Blazing Saddles itself. It's not funny, it just sucks! And just when you think you can see the credits on the horizon, it keeps on going back to Western land. Jesus, what the hell does it take? It does finally end, but at what cost? 
On April the 4th, 1975, CBS even aired a television series pilot based on the original outline called Black Bart, but they were under the impression it bombed. It was dumped immediately, but then CBS wanted six more episodes, which led to another six, and then six per season. In 1989, CBS and Warner Brothers came to an agreement that the former could air the movie and any sequels that may happen in exchange for co-producing a television series. They wanted to turn the film into an entire franchise with a new one each year, like the British Carry On films. But hidden in Mel Brooks' contract was that Warner brothers had to keep producing the Blazing Saddle stories, whether it be movies or television, or they would lose the rights to any sequel. The TV series was their way of keeping the rights, not to air it, but to keep producing it. So they spent four years on a freezing soundstage being paid to be in a show that may never even be released, just so the studio could keep the rights to any sequel. Unfortunately, it was all for nothing, no sequels were greenlit and the TV series was inevitably canned. Brooks, however, admitted that this was his plan all along. They basically had to make a sequel immediately or do a TV show within six months. Well, he knew they couldn't make a sequel in six months and that the movie was far too vulgar for a television series. He knew it was doomed from the very beginning. You brilliant bastard! I love it when you talk dirty. Much to his surprise though, the studio did come to him at one point saying they were making a sequel and he said they didn't have the rights. They assured him they did because of the TV show, which he had no idea about. They literally dragged him to the soundstage to show they had produced it, just never aired it, and the show was never even released. Though the pilot can be found on the 30th anniversary DVD. And in 2017, Mel Brooks did claim he wanted to make a stage play version sometime in the future. Look, Mel Brooks can write decent comedy, and there are some great gags in here, but a lot of it is just long, dragged out, unfunny, or trying to be edgy without an actual joke in there. He should have stopped trying to act his own material and maybe got rid of some of the other writers. But then again, he was the director and personally let every gag go in, so he's still to blame. I'm torn on this one. Half sucks, half is great. The movie's okay, but yeah, for historical purposes, it should be seen, and good night. It's 2.32 a.m. I'm gonna go to bed, I think.